to uh, show you a new tool. Um, there is a multiple choice poll um, on the side of your screen, which we'll be using uh, as we go through the session here. So read the, uh, the options down, down here on the slide and pull in in that multiple choice poll. I'll open the results up and it looks like uh, where, we're, where we're coming in is most people are somewhere in the, I know what idioms are, but I don't really get them correct. So I'm answering questions on the SAT and I'm not getting them right. And I'm not sure probably what goes along with that is a certain amount of stress um, because you're getting them wrong. You're not sure what to do about that. And that's a very, very common thing that we see students experience when they're dealing with idioms. All the way down, we finally had one, one person willing to say, I prefer to spell idiom, I-D-I-O-T. Congrats, you're a brave soul. I don't know who that is, <laughs> but we're all happy that you're, uh, that you're willing to share. All right, so what are idioms? Um, well, first of all, they're the least satisfying of all the error types on the SAT. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons why that is, is because they're correct for no other reason than that's just the way it is. Uh, one of the things that's most frustrating about idioms is that there is no general logic tool that you can use to apply to figure out how to get idioms right. So if you're facing an idiom and you're not sure why one is right and the other's wrong, stop stressing about that because there is no, there is no rhyme or reason to that. I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, so how do you get better at idioms? Um, this is a summary of what we're going to go over today. There's two big things you want to do. The first thing is um, understand prepositions. Idioms, one of the strangest error types on the test. It's no surprise that underlying idioms are one of the strangest parts of speech in the English language, which is the preposition. Second, if you want to improve at idioms, you need to keep an idiom list. So as you'll see in a moment, idioms are the type of thing where um, different people get different idioms wrong. And there's, it's, it's not really possible for me to make a general list of idioms because the list is too long. But what you can do personally is as you discover idioms that you use incorrectly, you can make a list of those so you can improve. And this is basically the most powerful tool that I've seen students apply to getting better at idioms really quickly. Um, I personally have an idioms list and I, I still add things to it to this day and there's still idioms that I use improperly. Very frustrating. Um, let me give you an example. Um, here's an example of a correct idiom, which is I listen to the radio. The idiom is, is the part that's highlighted in bold here. So listen goes with the word to. Here's some examples of incorrect idioms. I listen radio um, or I listen at the radio. Now these two words go together. The word listen goes with the word to. Compare that, on the other hand, to, to watching. You, I, the correct idiom for watch is to say, I watch television. An incorrect idiom to use with watch is to say, I watch to the television. Now, this is really interesting, and this is an example of how there's no rhyme or reason to idioms. Notice that when we say watch, the correct idiom is watch to. But when we say listen, the correct idiom is, sorry, the, blah, 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 that was wrong. Notice how that when we say watch, the correct idiom is you just say watch. And there is no extra word. It's just watch and then whatever it is you're watching. Right? On the other hand, when we talk about listening, the correct idiom is to say listen to. And it is incorrect to not have that to. Okay, there's no rhyme or reason to why this is. Um, it's purely uh, something that developed over time. The first person to ever say watch didn't say to. So every that caught on and that's the way we do it. And if you go back, there's a history to how these idioms develop. Um, you don't really need to concern yourself with it, but suffice to say, they pretty much just develop vernacularly, meaning people just start saying them and they stick and that's, that's what it turns into. Now, that being said, it sounds like idioms are completely unmanageable things. Like, oh, there's this giant list and they're all different and there's no way to tell which is right and which is wrong. Um, but there are some things that you can learn. So first of all, you want to uh, master the preposition because idioms, especially on the SAT, are going to be built by the sum of a preposition and some partner word. I say partner word is a pretty generic term because 
um, partner words are, it could be, really be any word. It could be a noun. It could be a verb. Rashik, Rashik is asking an interesting question. Does this happen in all languages? Yes, Rashik, pretty much all languages have some form of idioms. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, most languages develop verbally. They don't develop um, in a written way, which means the, typically the system for building languages is really dirty. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, it's actually pretty uncommon to find somebody who's really strong in math and really strong in grammar at the same time. Because if you have the type of mind who really likes a codified, um, clear-cut set of rules, math tends to fit better with your personality. If you feel more comfortable kind of just um, winging it and learning as you go and learning lots of special situations, um, your personality tends to fit better with grammar. Sometimes you'll find some, pe some people that are good at both, and that's, that's a really special person. So here we are. Um, I listen to the radio. The partner word here in this case is listen. The, uh, the preposition is the to, and we're going to define prepositions in a moment. But first, let's do a, a fast example, actually. This is a real SAT question. And take a stab at it. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do this on your own. When you, uh, when you think you know the answer, pull that into the multiple choice poll. Um, your objective here is to pull in um, the part of the sentence that is wrong. So you're trying to select where you have found an error. Okay, go ahead and pull in if you haven't had it, if you haven't done so already. If you're unsure at this point, go ahead and take a guess. Uh, helps to inform you know me what people are thinking if they're unsure, and we'll get a sense of what people are considering other than the correct answer. Also, okay, looks like people are. Uh, we have answers in every in every answer choice. Uh, people have selected every possible choice, but it looks like people are leaning toward um, answer choices A and answer choices C. So down in the chat window, what are the what are the arguments for for errors in A and C? Uh, so in A, it's what kind of books or what kinds of books. Right, so the question is, do we need that trailing S or not? Turns out those are both okay. That's a good example of a phantom. And when I say phantom, I mean something that um, it could go either way and both would be correct. So if you use the other one, your ear could trick you into thinking that's wrong because maybe you use the alternate version, but it turns out they're both correct. Good example of um, why on the SAT you really want to um, only eliminate something or pick that as the wrong answer if you can come up with a grammar rule that you can hang your hat on. So if you switch between kind and kinds, uh, it looks like maybe that's changing singular or plural, but it actually doesn't. So kind of books is actually a, a modifier for books. So we're not changing that's, we're not changing between singular or plural. The book the word books is already plural. Phantom is ph. Okay. Um, then I had a bunch of people answering uh, that they, for people who are picking C, what they're saying is they really wanted to see the word or in here, right? Instead of the word and, they wanted to see the word or, and, uh, and that's absolutely right. And this is a good example of an idiom. 
So what is the partner word? So this follow-up question for you guys in the chat window. How do you know the word should be or? And I'll tell you the answer has to do with a partner word. What is the partner word that goes with or? Yes, it is either or either, depending on how you say it. Um, right? Because tastes change and topics either get overexplored or lose their relevance. So in this particular case, the format of the idiom, and I'll kind of type this out um, in a modified way, is, and I'll put the idiom words here uh, in capital, either x or y. This is the format of the idiom that we're dealing with right now. X and Y are extra words that you fill in as part of the sentence, but the idiom, the structure that we care about are the words either and or. And those words go together. They're partners. If you have the word either, you need to have the word or. Right? You can't say either and. Either and would be an improper idiom. Again, don't stress out if you're not sure why that's the case. Um, that is the case for no rhyme or reason. Um, it is just the way this particular idiom is built. It could have gone a different way, uh, but it didn't. All right, so there's a good example of an SAT question that turns on an idiom issue. Um, so here's, here's my personal nemesis, um, is this particular idiom. And let's clear the polling. And uh, so which one of these, I'm, let's just do this one in real time. Which one of these do you prefer? And pull in your answer here. So the objective here is pick which one of these is used correctly and pull that into the chat window. Sorry, not in the chat window. Pull that into the multiple choice poll. Yeah, this is hard. This one, remember I was telling you that I have an idiom list? This is one of the ones that's on my list because I personally use this incorrectly. And it's really frustrating that I hear myself using it incorrectly just after I say it. So I'll be outside, I'll be out with friends or something and I'll say this and I'll be like, oh, my filter is just like a little bit too slow to catch me making the wrong choice. Um, so, and interestingly, most of you are getting caught um, in the wrong idiom here as well. So the, the most common answer, actually let me show the, show the polling on this one. Um, the most common answer was, I consider you to be smart. Second most common was, I consider you smart. And the third most common was, I consider you as smart. Uh, and nobody picked D or E. The correct idiom here is actually um, B. Yeah, it's actually, I consider you smart. It's this one. Uh, per, what I say when, I'm, when I make errors here is I say, I consider you to be smart. And the, the to be is superfluous here. You actually shouldn't have that. So the correct version of this idiom is I consider you smart. Similarly for the other ones, um, you don't say I consider you as smart. You don't say I consider you for smart or with smart. Now, if you're using the wrong idiom, again, it's not, this is not, you know, it's not a fault of yours. It was just, for whatever reason, you grew up in an environment where people said, I consider you to be smart. Um, but the correct idiom is, I consider you smart. So that's your correct answer there is B. So if this one, sounds like many of you need to add this onto your, onto your, uh, your idiom list. So you get out a piece of paper and start that out right now. Uh, it's not going to get very long. You'll probably only have 10 idioms or so on your idiom list, even after you've gone through a bunch of these. And what you'll do is you'll find those, hap those cropping up over and over and over again. So the sooner you get started making that list, the sooner you are going to move forward on idioms. Now, um, to get that list started, prepositions. Okay, so we've been over how idioms can be frustrating, but now let's talk about how we can get them under control. Um, and the answer is prepositions. So first of all, prepositions are the weirdest of all the parts of speech. So if you don't feel comfortable with what a preposition is, you're not alone. Um, I don't think I understood what a preposition was until, I think it was junior year of high school, actually, when somebody finally explained it to me. And, uh, and even when they did explain it to me, they only explained what I'm going to call the normal prepositions. They never explained the nonsense prepositions. Um, Oh, yes, a double question here. Madhav is saying, to, is to be ever used correctly? Yes. Um, so to be or not to be um, is correct grammar. Um, let me give you some examples of sentences that correctly use to be. Um, 
I would like to be taller. Um, to be is a fine thing. So yes, you can use that properly. And typically, um, typically when to be is used properly, it's not an idiom. It's actually a verb. Um, so in both of these sentence examples that I have here, to be is actually used as a verb, not as a preposition. Um, so I think maybe, Marav, what you're asking is, can to be ever be used properly as a as um, a preposition, and I would have to think about that. Um, and that would be that would actually be it's like if if somebody wants to Google that, look for the thing to Google is correct idiom using to be, and I can't think of one off the top of my head that uses that. Yeah, so maybe maybe the answer is that I cannot, but I'm not sure. So. Let's get back to prepositions. Uh, prepositions are the weirdest of all the parts of speech. Compa if you're not sure about that, compare them to the other parts of speech. Noun, those are things, verbs, things that you do. Adjective, words that modify nouns. Adverbs, words that modify verbs. You've got articles, which is just the and an, and you have pronouns, which are words that stand in for nouns. All this stuff is pretty straightforward. Um, and then you've got the mighty preposition, which is kind of just this grab bag of mediocrity. Um, You've got, <laughs> you've, got the, uh, you've got what people would describe as regular prepositions. Regular prepositions, and this is the thing that in grade school people will probably teach you, which is regular prepositions are designed to communicate either um, where or when something happens. And here are some examples. All of these are prepositions. You know, above, onto, among, under, toward, before, after, during. All of those are examples of idioms. Sorry, all of those are examples of prepositions. And those are what I'm going to call regular prepositions. They're prepositions that convey meaning. So when you hear the word above, that conveys information to you about the relationship of two things. You're saying the pillow is above the bed, for example. That doesn't sound right. It sounds like the pillow is hovering. You probably say the pillow is on the bed. In that case, on is your preposition, right? Interesting question in the chat window. What percentage of the SAT covers idioms? I was actually going over this today. Um, and I want to say that about one in five questions will have some kind of idiom issue on it. So this is a really, really common concept. So it's not necessarily the case that you have to use an idiom to answer one out of five questions correctly. It's that, you know, it is the fact that you will deal with idioms on about 20% of questions. I'm also, uh, that, that number's anecdotal. That's not something that I, that's not an analysis that I just did. Uh, but I was looking at a list of questions filtered by error type. Um, and I would say it's about one in five. If you go to www.tested.com and you create an account there, you can study questions based on um, their type. And you can get a sense for how commonly these things come up. So let's move on from regular prepositions to what we're going to call nonsense prepositions. Nonsense prepositions are a whole new class of preposition. We call them prepositions, but they should really have a different name because they actually don't convey any useful information. Right? For example, check out all these sentences in here. What is your opinion as a student? One has to live by a code. I live for this stuff. Lee is afraid of the dark. I'm frustrated with this subject. <laughs> this is like uh, this massage chair is important to me. All of these are idioms, right? And all of these are prepositions. These prepositions, if you really dig into them, you'll notice don't convey any extra information. Uh, if for whatever reason we had chosen to say uh, this massage chair is important for me, and that was the way we decided to phrase that. Um, important for instead of important to, then that would be correct and important to would be incorrect. You might be thinking, oh, that's nonsense. I totally, uh, two sounds correct and four sounds incorrect. There must be a reason. But if you dig into it, what you'll find out is there is not a reason. 
these nonsense prepositions, these are the currency of idioms, right? Idioms in, in spoken English, American English, actually idioms are quite varied and they deal with plenty of regular prepositions as well and there's plenty of idioms that actually don't use prepositions. But when it comes to SAT errors, SAT errors traffic almost exclusively in prepositions that are nonsense prepositions. And the reason why is because the nonsense prepositions are the words that people use incorrectly. So if you consider regular prepositions, let's go back actually, you're not going to say above when you meant below, right? That would be very silly, right? You'd have to not know what above meant or not know what below meant. But you very well might say to when you should be using for. And the reason why that can happen is because since the words convey no meaning, there's no guide to help you figure out which one is correct. So you have to just know what the correct one is. So how you can protect yourself here against uh, nonsense prepositions, the main, your main line of defense is to memorize the six vicious nonsense prepositions. Right? There are six of these that come up so often that it's worth you writing them down and memorizing this list specifically. And if you see one of these words on the test, the chances that it's involved in an error is so high uh, that you might as well stop and evaluate it for a preposition error right there. Right? You're just reading along. If you're just reading along and blah, 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 you come up to the word for, the chances that it's involved in an idiom on the test is very, very high. So it's worth just considering even if you spot it. And the six nonsense prepositions are as, by, for, of, with, and to. Um, I have a hard time remembering things, so I usually have some kind of mnemonic that I can use to remember things. The mnemonic I use for these are a big fart odor with tuna. I'm just going to pause here for a minute to let you imagine that. It'll help it sink in better. <laughs> uh, right, and the first letter of each of these words is one of the six vicious prepositions. So if you can remember a big fart odor with tuna, you can remember the six vicious nonsense prepositions, and that'll help defend you against idioms. So now we know what the idiom monster is. How do we slay it? Big steps for slaying idioms. One, notice something weird is going on with the preposition. So particularly on the SAT, if you're dealing with um, identifying sentence errors, which is a type of question where you have multiple variants, Right? You could notice that an idi a, uh, a nonsense preposition is changing in the answer choices. Right? If some of the answer choices have two, some of them have four, and some of them have by. Strong signal. It's a 95% shot you have some kind of idiom error in there. Right? So step one, notice something weird is going on with the preposition. Step two, find the partner word. So the, the um, nonsense preposition will go with some partner word in that sentence. So you're going to need to use your gut a little bit to figure out what partner word is governing that idiom. And lastly, consult your gut. Um, so this is the last time I'm ever going to say it. Actually, I'll say it many, many more times in the future, but I will always be in reference to idioms. <laughs> this is the, the first and last category where this will be the answer um, on the SAT, which is for idioms, you need to consult your gut. This is a really important concept because um, for, the, for the entire rest of SAT grammar, you should be using known grammar rules to make decisions. You should not be listening to your gut. You should not be going based on sound. You should know why something's wrong. You should always know why, with the exception of idioms. When it comes to idioms, if you've identified you have a preposition thing going on, find the partner word, check your gut, whatever it says, that's what you should go with. And this is really useful because once you know that this is a gut-based thing, it should allow you to move much, much faster. So if you're having timing problems on the SAT, this is an area where you can pick up some time, gain a little speed. For example, this is another real SAT question. Um, I'm going to give you another 60 seconds to do this one on your own. And when you come up with your answer, uh, type that into the, not the chat window, but the multiple choice poll which is over on the side near the chat window.
Oh, this is just fantastic. Um, let me broadcast the results, and and you'll see how the polling came in. And this is just a this is just a terrific terrific result to have here at the end of the idiom study hall. Um, so first of all, uh, the major the majority of people are polling in A, which is the correct answer. John Edgar Wideman is regarded it should be regarded as one of the most talented writers of the late 20th century, not regarded to be. Rashik, you totally, you're totally in my head now about that whether to be is possibly ever used correctly <laughs> as an idiom. And it was, a great, it was a great setup for you suggesting that in the chat window, right? Um, so we're all going to have to go home and read about that later. Uh, the, other, the reason why this is great, though, so most of you are polling in A, which is the correct answer, but the next biggest group of people, um, about a third of you are polling in D. And so why am I so excited that so many of you are polling in D? Well, the, answer, the reason is because D is, one of, is another one of our six vicious nonsense prepositions. So, and this is, this is a great thing that you guys are doing, which is to say, oh, I'm not really sure about the, um, about the idiom, but I've definitely picked out something that it was based on a, on a systematic process, which is I found one of the six vicious nonsense prepositions, which, and which means the odds are that an error is here is very high. So that makes D a great guess. Um, D is not correct. So the partner word that goes with D is um, such. Right. So here's the correct idiom um, in D is such x as y. And the idiom um, that was correct, there, the correct answer choice A, the one that was used incorrectly, it should be um, regarded as. So the partner word here is regarded. Great job, everybody. Let's do a quick summary here um, of idioms. First of all, idioms are the least satisfying of all the error types. Part of the reason why is because there is no uh, general rule that can be applied here. Uh, you have to know. You have to know the correct idiom in order to get it right. Um, also, part of that sets you free. So, if you once you disco discover that something is an idiom, you can safely um, look at your gut and take a fast shot. So, don't spend a lot of time thinking about idioms. Um, idioms are correct because that's just the way it is. It's something that has been set in vernacular spoken English over hundreds and thousands of years. And it doesn't always make sense, and it doesn't always follow patterns. The two different ways to get better at idioms, things that we've covered now and should sound very familiar to you. One, understand prepositions, the weirdest of all the uh, parts of speech. Particularly, remember the six uh, vicious nonsense prepositions. Uh, and you can use the mnemonic, a big fart odor with tuna, to remember um, as, by, for, of, with two. Those are the six nonsense prepositions you want to remember. And second of all, um, keep an idiom list. So for example, many of you had that um, consider. You use the idiom consider to be, where the correct idiom is just consider, and to be should not be in there. So put that on your idiom list. Um, also add this other one, referred. Actually, the one we just did was regarded. So if you, if you got the regarded one, put that one on your list as well. If you want more further idiom practice, go check out www.tested.com. Um, we have, you can get a free account there. It'll allow you to take questions that are specifically idiom focused. Um, and or you can sign up to work with a one-on-one -on -one 99 percentile score coach if you'd like to work with somebody personally to get better at these things. It takes a lot of work to put together study hall and put together tested. So I'd like to just give some quick shout outs to Miro, Miro, Kaz, Kazakoff, Jackson, Harvard, Noel, David, Pikachu, Chippendale, Lee, the chemist, Akamondo, Shonak, the closer, Patel, Morella, Brazil, Crespi, David, Chubby Shorts, High Song, Charles, Kitten, Smuggler, Reese, Appy, the Saint, Anglestead, and last but not least, I'm the real Tom Rose, and you've been watching studyhall.tested.com, Mondays, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Before you take off, please send us some feedback. We're putting a couple of polls on the screen right now. Um, really love to get your feedback on these things. This is a first study hall for us, so please let us know uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you changed about it. 
Um, particularly if you liked it, make sure that you uh, let us know so that <laughs> so that we do more of these, uh, which we'll do pretty much based on uh, student enthusiasm. And pull in suggestions that you'd like to hear for future study halls as well. We're going to put that one up on the slide, up on the screen in just a moment. So if you guys need to take off, now's the time. We've covered all the material we're going to do for the day. I'll, of course, stick around for more questions for a couple of minutes. And I will look forward to seeing all of you again next time, Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. Pacific. Studyhall.tessa.com.